Hi, and welcome to the Media Twits number 158. I'm Mark Glazer, Executive Editor of PBS Media Shift. Today we'll be talking about the new massive report from Pew Research, the state of the news media, looking at how the media in different forms is rising and falling. And this year it's all about mobile and mobile ruling, especially among top news sites. We're seeing more traffic from mobile than they are from desktop. Before we get into our discussion, a word from our sponsor. Running your own business requires focus, and so does parenting. MediaTwit's podcast sponsor, NextSpace, created a place where parents could give their best quality of attention to both, co-working space and childcare space under one roof. Learn more at nextspace.us slash nextkids. Also, PBS Media Shift has just launched a new series of online trainings called Digital Ed in partnership with top journalism schools. We have one-hour courses covering everything from iPhone audio reporting to starting your own venture. Real-world media training for the digital age. Sign up at digitaledcourse.com. So before we get into our discussion today, I want to introduce our panel we have Amy Mitchell joining us from Pew Research Center, Andrew Lee from American University, Ricardo Bilton from Digiday, Jefferson Yen, our producer from Los Angeles, and Kerry Hoffman from PRX. Um, so looking at this big report, there's obviously a lot to digest. Um, this is, I believe, the 12th annual report um, from Pew, one of the big top line things is that 39 of the 50 top news sites are now seeing more traffic coming from mobile than they are from desktop, um, which I guess we all kind of assume that was the case, but that's it's amazing to really see that in the numbers. Um, there's also a few other numbers around cable news audiences and newspaper audiences are down while local TV and network news are actually up slightly. Um, there's also some numbers around podcasting and how podcasts have grown um, over the past year and actually over the past number of years. So we'll dig into those numbers a little bit more. Um, first, I want to talk to you, Amy. You really kind of shepherded this report as you have um, before. And, you know, we're seeing this big growth in mobile audiences. Um, but I guess there's a little bit of a downside there and that I guess the audiences aren't spending as much time um, if they're coming in mobile versus desktop. And what, what are you seeing in the trends for mobile? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the conundrums that news organizations face, is that you're seeing more and more audience that's coming to your content, finding your content through mobile devices. And content functions differently there than it does in desktops. As we know, as each of these digital spaces is evolving, the, the, the news works differently. People connect with it differently. The kind of content that, that, that people are going to get drawn into uh, is, is, looks a little different on mobile than it does on desktop. But at the same time, when you look at engagement, the time that's spent uh, per visit uh, and per page, it still is greater um, in most of these cases on uh, uh, desktop than it is on mobile devices. And so as a news organization weighing those two in addition to whatever other legacy platforms you may have still going on, uh, you know, is a lot to tackle. Yeah, it is. There's a lot to think about because you want to design for mobile, obviously, because that's where the growth is. But then again, you know, if time spent is more important, desktop is still, is still there. It's still pretty important, right? Absolutely, absolutely, and there's still a lot of traffic that's coming in that way, and so, you know, especially if your financial situation is one that's not allowing you a whole lot of <laughs> opportunity to, you know, throw money into experimentation, how do you figure out how to allocate those dollars and the way that you're spending your time in terms of customizing your content? Uh, it is a challenge, and that's where, you know, as a news organization, figuring out who your audience is, where they're likely to be, what it is they're, they're interested in, and how you can tell your stories in creative ways um, is all a really important part of the news process today. No doubt. And then on mobile, you know, we're still seeing some of the numbers you came up with were that, um, you know, as far as mobile advertising goes, you know, the, really being dominated by Facebook and Twitter and not so much a lot of the kind of news apps. 
Yeah, absolutely. And this is what we saw when we started tracking um, display advertising on the browser space is that you had your five big tech companies come in real fast and start and control already, you know, 50% plus of that um, digital display overall, which was largely on the browser base. We're seeing the same thing happen now in mobile display. The growth rate is very huge, 78% year over year, I believe is what our number is. Um, Facebook alone accounts for about 37% of that. Uh, and they account for about a quarter of your of your uh, display advertising overall. So, you know, news isn't getting a very large portion of that dollar, and really, you know, we don't see, um, you know, there's no sense that news is figuring out a way to actually um, get more of the pie. No question, um, Ricardo. In looking at kind of some of these ad numbers that we're seeing, um, you know, banner ad numbers, you know, overall are still up. 12%, but video has been really the big driver, 56% growth. I guess that's not quite as big as it was in previous years, but that's still that's still pretty big. What do you think about that as far as kind of the video ad numbers that you're seeing there? Well, the video production numbers are going to follow the ad rates. Um, I mean, you're, you're as a publisher, you're going to make a lot more money on video advertising, pre-roll, than you are on uh, display. So it's pretty sensible that you know, all those numbers, you're seeing, I mean, right now we have in New York City the New Fronts, which, um, where every, basically every publisher you can think of is um, going on stage and talking about their new video products, um, you know, Vice, Refinery29, BuzzFeed, uh, Vox Media, um, because they're all realizing that the traditional display numbers, that, that business is um, is in a free fall for many publishers. So one way to survive now, the most compelling way now is to do more video, uh, create it, uh, get audiences to it, and then sell sponsorships off of it. So I mean, it's just a, a reaction to what they're seeing with um, the declines in, the overall declines in display, and the, the challenges of just monetizing uh, the mobile audiences. Yeah, for sure, and we'll, we'll be talking about the new fronts, I think, on next week's show in more depth, but, um, you know, as we showed up there, I mean, the problem, I guess, is that when you look at who's doing well in digital advertising overall, you're, you know, it's Google, Facebook, Microsoft, I mean, Yahoo does some original reporting, AOL, but really it's not the big news publishers that we think about, you know, they're just such a small piece of the pie, and so... I guess it makes it hard when you have to think about should these news publishers be working with Facebook, you know, and posting original content and all that. That all comes up when you think what huge share Facebook has, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The I mean, you're, that's sort of a it's something that publishers struggle with now. I mean, Facebook is going to start doing this more, saying that you know, I don't know if they want publishers to publish everything through Facebook, but. To say you know you know create some exclusive videos you know Facebook is getting um, the Onion I think and a few others to create videos exclusively for Facebook and there's going to be a, rev a revenue share model um, through that but uh, yeah I mean the, the challenge is you don't want to overinvest in Facebook um, though some publishers are are just fine doing that I think it really depends on on the business model underlying business model of, of the publishers that we're we're talking about. For sure, like BuzzFeed with native ads, it makes more sense to be everywhere. And for others who really count on subscription revenue, it's going to take away from it. Right. I mean, if your if your business is to drive people back to your site um, and uh, show them ads on your site, then something like posting directly to Facebook isn't as compelling if you're going to make less money there. Um, but if you will make more money on Facebook, and we don't know yet because those deals haven't been uh, there's no nothing no public information about that, then maybe it makes more sense. For sure. And Carrie, let's bring you into the discussion because, um, you know, there were some numbers this time around podcasting. I know Pew has done that before, although not really as big of a part of the state of the news media. But we saw that 17% of Americans have listened to a podcast in the last month, which, you know, shows some regularity, which is up from 9% in 2008. Um, you know, what do, what do you think about all these? I mean, the numbers look like they're up across the board when it comes to podcasting. Awareness is up. Number of podcasts are up. I mean, what, what do you take away from some of these numbers, Carrie? Same for, uh, you know, we're seeing the similar growth on all of our podcasts. And we now have a real growing roster. And, you know, our audience in the last year has easily tripled. In some 
case is you know quintupled for some of our some of our shows. But but what we experience is similar to what Amy said, which is that while while we're getting a lot of traffic from mobile devices, um, people are actually still listening more on the web, and they're listening for a longer duration. Um, in actually native apps. So it's sort of both things. So the web is still the biggest funnel we have to get new listeners and attract people, whether it's whether it's through Facebook or whether it's our own efforts to do outreach. That's still the biggest way that um, we're attracting people. Then the trick for us is what do we do about them when we get them? You know, how are we making them subscribers, signing them up to newsletters? How are we engaging those listeners in a significant way? Um, in a significant way, and um, our, you know, we're redoing PRX to enable this, and uh, you know, greater listening. And I think that the, um, you know, the revenue has really shown itself to be strong, get, you know, gaining stronger in the podcast world. It's just that it's still such a small slice of the overall listening habits that we we are challenged by. Acquiring those new people. Where do we? Where do they find us? Where do we find them? And we are developing our good, intimate skills on what we do about about it when we get them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we also saw some numbers from Pew about the number of podcasts going up, and it seems like, especially among kind of the bigger news outlets, they're all kind of launching more and more podcasts. I mean, is there? A worry at all about just oversaturation with the number of people trying to, you know, produce this number and trying to make this them all sustainable. Well, sure. I mean, I think that you that was the case with uh, you know blogging a number of years ago too. I mean, the the next wave will be you know the what's strong, how you know good good content, good quality content will still be what rules the day, and so and uh, discoverability, findability, you know, making sure that. Um, we improve little things that help us, including the titles we use, the keywords we use, making sure that our pro we we pay a lot of attention to this, making sure our producers don't skimp on that metadata that's required when they post it, their show to iTunes, etc. That's a real simple thing that happens on a regular basis. So we pay a lot of attention to that because um, you know I think that the the we need. You know things like Serial and you know the real big, strong invisibility to you know the big shows that came out this year. Uh, they help all, and um, and they also set a certain bar for uh, quality and et cetera. And we try to do that with Radiotopia too. That's why Radiotopia isn't 200 shows; it's 11 shows. And so that's kind of our strategy too. You know, keep the quality high, make them all discoverable, cross promote. Um, we don't have a cookie cutter version of Radiotopia. Um, we, you know, not all, sh not every show is the same. It's, they're not formulaic. We do really celebrate the differences between them, and you know, make sure that we have the echo effect for their own audiences. Yeah, for sure. And Andrew, you had some concerns just about, you know, the numbers are rising for podcasts, but like Carrie said, there's still a number of people who, I mean, the awareness is still what 50% who don't even know about them, right? I, I thought the numbers are quite interesting. I mean, obviously, if anyone listens to this podcast knows that I'm a big fan of podcasts, but I was intrigued to see that the chart they had about awareness of podcasts, although it's doubled since 2006, it's relatively flat since 2010. So over the last five, six years, it's went from 45% of the U.S. population um, are aware of podcasts to 49%, which is pretty, you know, pretty flat there. So it's interesting, I think, the, the rise in recent years of the popularity podcast might be just the cult of podcast listeners listening to more podcasts, um, which is certainly the case for me. But it's going to be interesting to see the future of podcast popularity, and maybe we're just waiting for a, you know, the younger generation to see this as a, as a mainstream way of getting their content, or whether we're just going to keep ambling along with podcasts being something only people in the know really tap into, um, or our power users, or whether it's going to become mainstream in any way. Yeah. And I'm also curious about your thoughts on mobile and how we're seeing such a huge growth. I mean, we, we all assume and, you know, we're all, a lot of us media people are pretty much addicted to our devices and on and all the time, 
Um, and we all feel like, yes, mobile is the future, but um, did, did this seem like a pretty, I mean, it seems like it's really going fast, especially 2014, 2015 seemed really big. Yeah, I, I think for our community, the wake-up call for me at least, and I've been seeing this for about two years in other areas, including Wikipedia and online participation, um, but at ONA this past year, there were pr presentations from CNN and BuzzFeed, and they were already saying that after 5 p.m. and on weekends, mobile traffic exceeded desktop traffic. So it looks like going forward, and I'd love to hear Amy's views on this, that you know, outside of office hours, the mobile device, whether it's the tablet or your phone or your, your watch now, um, is going to be the device of preference for the personal user. The desktop is really just going to be for your power users and when you're at work, and that's the main device in front of your face. And even at colleges, we're starting to see students show up for the first day of college with just either a tablet or a phablet, and no laptop, no desktop, nothing. And they're just saying, this is my primary device. And if you want me to write a paper, point me to the computer lab. And that's a big shock for us in academia because we've been taking down our computer labs for years because we expect people to show up with a laptop computer to college. And now we're seeing that number dip, not going up to 90, 95%, but actually coming down because students are saying, oh, you know, I've got my big iPhone 6 Plus, I've got my tablet, that's my main computing device. And if you want me to sit down and type, I've got to go find a lab to do that. That's quite fascinating. And yeah. then the other thing that I'm concerned about is what does the nature of participation look like when mobiles are the majority? Um, for the community that I study in Wikipedia, it's a huge concern because Wikipedia depends a lot on people contributing and writing and researching and putting citations in. That is primarily a, a keyboard, desktop, or laptop type of endeavor. And if we have this whole new generation of folks coming in now where um, the, the keyboard is not, where the physical keyboard is not the primary interface for interacting with the web, already we're seeing a lot of sites trying to react to that. Like, what's the nature of thumb participation versus typed participation on sites? Um, so you could see a big dip in terms of commenting on websites on long um, considered uh, commentary, and that's a real concern going forward that we might actually have this massive drop off in deep participation when it comes to uh, writing and engaging folks. Good points, Andrew. And I mean, it looked like you just flashed us a, what was that, an Apple Watch that yeah. you have there on your wrist? Yeah. All right. Show it off for us. Yeah. It's all jealous. Um, Amy, what's, what's your response to that about kind of the mobile, you know, the way you're seeing in mobile trends and, and even, I, I don't know if you even track participation, but what are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's really interesting. It's going to be fascinating to watch how this develops over the next, you know, really even over the next decade. Uh, one of the other areas where we're seeing mobile growth is in, you know, what you'd call in our country the digital divide, where you actually have a lot of folks, whether it's because of the lack of broadband access to their homes or to their communities or their financial situations, that are getting um, smartphones, uh, but you know, they don't have the capacity for one reason or another to have broadband in their home with a desktop computer, and so their digital experience is through their phones. We've seen that happening in other countries um, as well that sort of skipped that desktop era um, uh, due largely to the economies and, and abilities to get broadband into their country. So that's a whole other part of the population that may be more mobile first, if you think about it. Um, you know, people do still spend a lot of time at the office on their desktop, and so there is still some sense of total time spent um, where that desktop computer, for many, for, you know, for at least, you know, the foreseeable future is still going to be a part of the picture in terms of their digital experience. And it's, you know, it's a matter of balancing these things out um, because they do function differently. Yeah, and it was interesting to see, like, you had this, these charts about, you know, where mobile tops desktop and where desktop uh, tops mobile and usage for different sites and some of them that had more mobile usage did seem to be some of the kind of digital only like Bleacher Report, um, you know, uh, I think Vice, Gawker, Salon all had more usage among mobile and then in desktop topping mobile there were sites like MSN, News, BBC, and CNET, which I guess are a little bit more mature. I mean, were you, that's among the top sites, but were you seeing kind of trends in that as far as who really had more mobile versus desktop and vice versa? 
Yeah, I mean, I think you speak to a, to a really good point, which is that many of those that are already mobile first are those that, you know, began later in the digital era and, and, and began with more of a, of a mobile presence, uh, if you will, in terms of their thinking about how they're going to structure their site and have audiences, um, perhaps, that also started with them with mobile devices compared with something like, you know, BBC or MSN, which has had, you know, legacy audience that that um, was with them during the desktop era before they even had a phone in their pocket. So um, you are, you know, you have different development stages in terms of, of uh, what your audiences are accustomed to in the ways that they communicate with you and, and connect with you. And, you know, social is a whole other element of this as well, right, which is sort of developed in tandem with mobile. Um, you know, not exactly the same thing, but also bringing in this element of, of news that is is mixed within all this other stuff you're doing over the course of the day that that is a different kind of experience than you'd have in the desktop realm. Yeah, and I, I don't know if you if you included this. I didn't see it on kind of your fact sheets, but among these kind of digital native sites, um, are, is their traffic growing faster than some of the traditional ones, or is it is it kind of a mixed bag? That was not something that we looked at. I mean, we do know if you look at some of the larger, you know, digital um, uh, only entities, there are some that had some real positive years and others that hit a bunch of stumbling blocks. So, you know, it's not, you know, there's also a lot that can be challenging about moving into the new space as a digital only. Yeah. Carrie, did, did you want to have yeah, some thoughts you wanted to throw in? I did. I, did. I wanted to add that um, you know, we, we make, uh, we, we've built a few mobile apps, and one of the things that we've noticed is that listening on uh, native apps is actually still like even though what we just said a minute ago that you know people are still listening on a de desktop more than mobile web they're actually listening in the duration on a on a native app is actually better than both web and mobile web and that doesn't mean there's more people doing it it just means their their time with it is better cuz most people will pull up the app they want they'll hit the play button they'll put it in their pocket and they'll go about Business. So there's some of that that makes sense, but you know we we've just had this pendulum swing of everybody's wanting to do mobile web and decreasing investment in native apps, but in terms of like length of engagement, um, the native apps are still pretty strong, at least from our perspective. I could see that. What what do you think about that, Ricardo? As far as kind of the app usage versus kind of mobile web, we've seen this go. I feel like the pendulum swung at least two or three times back and forth between. You know, everyone's saying you have to have an app. You just have to have an app to, well, maybe, you know, mobile web is fine and why bother and how do you get your app in front of people? I mean, where do you think we are now when it comes to apps, especially in kind of news consumption and information? Well, I think that the challenge in mobile is probably the same challenge as on desktop. When you think about how people are getting information and finding news, it's primarily through social channels, right? So you see something on uh, Facebook, or Twitter, and then that's and then you click over. Um, and in most of those cases, you're not going to actually have that app installed. Um, so for the for the news consumer, for the average person, the mobile web is is where they're going to interact with most news brands. For where well, I think there's a lot more room for um, I guess loyalty or, or engagement is in the app space, and I think. You have publishers have a little bit more control and a lot more ability to create a a stronger uh, native experience on the app level for those um, for those readers who are really engaged with it. Um, I mean, one of the best examples apps that I, I'm really a fan of and sort of speaks to the potential is uh, New York Times NYT Now, which is the New York Times sort of aggregation slash. Um, sort of briefing app, which they've actually just made free because I think they realized that it's a significant. There was a time previously where you could only get it through subscriptions. So you're spending eight dollars a month to get that app. Now they made it free because um, I think they realized that that is a significant hurdle to getting people in the app experiences if they have to if they have to pay for it. Um, but I mean, every, it, yeah, like you said, it's a pendulum. Some people are doing it. Some people realize it's not worth the trouble. But you know. I think it's one of those things that just depends, which is not a, very, a great, uh, not a helpful answer. But I mean, BuzzFeed is making their own news app. Um, I think people are doing it. It's just that it has. It just depends on where it fits in with the, the overall business and the goals. Um, but for users, for for you and me, or not really you and me, but you know, the regular 
person, uh, the app is still sort of a hard sell. For a lot of people. Yeah. Andrew, do you, do you agree with that as far as apps go? I mean, it does feel like when you look at the numbers that Pew's putting out that it's still, you know, Facebook and Twitter are bringing in the most mobile revenues. So if you're finding something on a mobile app and you're, and you're going to pull up a story from, someone else, from somewhere else, but it's still going to remain on that app, you're not going to see the ads. Um, it seems like that's still going to be, you know, advantage to the social networks, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess the... the Odd thing is that Facebook and Twitter are partially the savior of the open web because everyone else is going towards apps. So, you know, the 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 good thing is that Twitter and Facebook need, you know, HTTP open web links to actually be useful, whereas the trends on these other folks are to make apps and keep people in the ecosystem. I think that the comment that Carrie had is really interesting, seeing how many people experience podcasts not in the open marketplace of the podcast app that Apple has or with these specialized clients like Overcast or Eyecatcher, um, they're actually experiencing podcasts within the brand of that app. Um, so that's interesting because it means that just because you're a listener of one or two podcasts doesn't mean you're going to discover this great universe of other podcasts out there. You're actually just stuck in this very narrow niche of what you're comfortable with, and that's what the app supplies you, right, is that, that, uh, that, that garden where you live with PRX material or NPR material or Slate material but you're not actually going out there and seeing this, this vast marketplace of podcasting, which is a great marketplace, but it's confusing and it's weird and it's inconsistent how to get to that content. Yeah, yeah. Carrie, do you see that as a, as a challenge and just getting people to find what's out there? I mean, obviously they can find NPRs on NPR and they can find, you know, each one in its own little place, but it does feel like you know, iTunes obviously has a directory and there's some others, but it's it's sometimes not always easy to find them. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we think that, I mean, most, the most common way that I think people find podcasts is because somebody, a, a human being that they know told them. And that's still, that's still, or one of their favorite podcasts pitched another, uh, you know, what are, you know, what am I listening to? And I, uh, if I'm a, popular producer, but that's that's still um, that's still the best engine, and I think that um, you know there was a day when the iTunes chart uh, was a driver, in, but I don't, you know, to your point earlier, there's a lot of noise out there now, and I don't know that that's, you know, the algorithm for that is, you know, less persuasive for most people, too. I think okay. it's all true for music, but less so for podcasts. Yep. Well, thanks for the discussion. It was really interesting. I want to thank our panel um, on the show, Amy Mitchell from Pew Research, Andrew Lee from American University, Kerry Hoffman from PRX, Ricardo Bilton from Digiday, and Jefferson Yen, our producer. I want to thank our sponsor, Next Space and Next Kids. You can learn about their pioneering program at nextspace.us slash next kids and also check out our new trainings at Media Shift Digital Ed. You can learn more about them at digitaledcourse.com. Uh, we'll catch you each and every Friday on the Media Twits. Um, you can catch us on PBS Media Shift at mediashift.org. Thanks everyone and have a great weekend. Mm -hmm.